All right, let's do this. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk about creating recommender systems with Spark, Scala, and Prediction.io. My name is Florian Kraus. I work for performance advertising. Don't get fooled by the app. It says something completely different about me. That's not me. It must have been a mix up with the persons there. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to be having a look at two different types of uh, recommenders. One would be the product similarity, which is something you get in pretty much any e-commerce shop where you have like this product is similar to that one. And the other one is what everybody knows from Amazon. People who looked at this also looked at that or bought that and uh, bought that. So these similar items based on the interaction uh, people did to their site. Um, we're going to have a short look at Scala and functional programming and why this is a good match for doing this kind of development. And at the end, we're going to look at Spark and Prediction.io, which are two very powerful tools for building up such an engine. And at the very end, if you've got some time left, we're going to have a look at how you can actually run your engine. Um, let's start with a bit of theory. But first of all, I want to preface. Um, I'm also I've been doing recommender systems for the past two years now. I more, come more from the software development region. I was head of development for about you for three years. And then at the very end, they made me also head of BI. And this is where I got first introduced in this whole recommenders and similar product things. Um, there, they were using PHP. And you can do that. It works. It's just that it didn't feel like the right language to do such a thing. Next job was at Rebel. Rebel is a marketplace for fashion online. And they had the big problem that every product they have is only available once. It's like an eBay-based approach. So they have one size and one color. And for them, it was really important to have good recommenders so that when people come to the site, they see products they like and also they see products that fit them, which is really different to any other e-commerce site. And now I'm working for Performance Advertising. It's an agency that specializes in optimizing online marketing campaigns. And well, you can guess, they are also very interested in doing this kind of algorithms to optimize the performance of their marketing. So let's have a look at products. We have a very, very basic product here. We have sweater A and sweater B. Um, as you can see, they have both prices. One is 118, 160 euros or whatever currency. And then you have the old price, which is, um, I don't know, price before reduction. So if you want to say how similar are these two items, then let's make a graph out of it. All right, beautiful graph, product A, product B. So the formula for saying how similar these items based on their vectors representing them are, is, would be the angle between the two of them. Um, this is what's called cosine similarity. The formula looks like this. It's a bit scary, uh, but if you plug in the numbers, then you're going to see it's actually not so bad. So again, our two products, product A, product B, and uh, you see on the top of it, we are doing uh, what's called the dot, uh, dot product of the two vectors. So we are taking the price one and pri uh, multiplying it with the price from product two and adding the old price from product A, product B. And then at the bottom, we are taking the length of each vector and uh, taking the, the, square, um, the, root, the square of it and the, the square root and then multiplying this two. And this gives us one, 0 0.981. And this stands for these products are 98% similar. So here you got in mathematical terms how similar two products are. If you got something like this, then the products would be 0% uh, similar. You could also have like minus 100% similar, where uh, the lines are completely opposing each other, but normally this doesn't make any sense because you hardly ever have any negative values in e-commerce or so, so normally you have positive values. These products are 100% similar, so as you can see, it's not so much about the length of the lines, but it's actually about how much they match. So this is the thing, it only really works nice for numerical values. So of course, if 60 euros is less than 100 euros, makes sense, you can totally use that. You cannot use it, unfortunately, for uh, database IDs. So I don't know if ID 17 is trousers and ID 18 is shoes, then 18 is more than 17, but still there is no correlation between that. So, so you can't use it for that. And what you can do in this case, um, you can something called, do something called one-hot encoding, where you take all the attributes you want to have and map them to another dimension. So this dimension then gets either a zero or a one as a value. For a product, say sweater A, uh, it is yellow. This is what you get there. So we add three more dimensions. Two of them are zero, one of them is one. And same thing you do for sweater A. So this is how you can map this. The downside of this now, of course, is I can't do any nice fancy graphs anymore because I have five dimensions now and it's going to be hard drawing that out. 
still um, the formula works exactly as before. So there's no difference how you would map this. Like with normal recommenders you do, you're going to typically end up between, I don't know, 600 to 1,000 dimensions or so. You're going to add a lot of more data to it. Just for the sake of simplicity, I reduced the numbers here. Another thing you do is called bucketing. So, for example, if you wanted to have when a shop was added, uh, when a product was added into your shop, then it wouldn't be wise to add the exact date because the information you get out of that is probably nothing. I mean, if it's the 30th or the 29th, it doesn't matter. So, in this case, you would use something called bucketing, where you would say, for example, I have four buckets called seasons, and if the product was added in, I don't know, February, then it would be in the spring or winter season. So, like this, re you reduce the complexity of your model. And the buckets, again, they also get one hot encoded. So you always have four dimensions for your seasons here. What we're doing here right now is called feature engineering. It's one of the tasks you do in order to prepare your data and to pimp up the data you so it fits your needs and it gives you good results. So let's, let's have a look at ALS, alternating least square. Sounds scary. How this works is basically you have a matrix. On the top of the matrix, you're going to see product A to product C. And on the left-hand side, you're going to have your users. And you give scores. So for example, product uh, user B saw product A. Get him one point. Um, you can do more things. You can do something like um, product B was, uh, sorry, user B bought product A. So that gives him five points because we assume that buying something expresses more of the desire that you want the product than just looking at it. And as a last thing, what you can also do, you could also give negative points that if you, I don't know, a user removed a product from the wish list of the basket or he disliked it, you have like a dislike button, then you can also give negative points as we did with product C here. Um, what you end up with here is a very large matrix. I mean, think about you might have 100,000 products and one and a half million users, so this will be very, very large. And there will also be a lot of holes in it, which is called a sparse matrix because not every user would have seen every product, so most of your matrix will be empty. And in order to work with that better, you do the ALS, the alternating least square. How this works is you're going to break down your matrix into two matrices, and one is called the user features, and one, the other matrix would be called the product features. And in this case, we reduced the dimensions to two, so we went from three dimensions to two, um, in real life, you probably use something like know, 20, 30 dimensions for your ALS matrix. And the other thing also you see are the product features, same thing, product A, A to C, and they have two dimensions. The numbers themselves, they don't really mean much. Basically what it is, what these are called, is the, these are called the latent features. These are the numbers that express the interactions of a user on the side with the product. Uh, on, a demand, on a reduced dimension, dimension and a level. What if you were to do this? If you were to multiply these two matrices again, then you would get back an approximation of the original matrix. So this is how you approach the problem with reducing the, the dimensions and pulling the thing apart with the, into the users and to the product features. Now, calculating similarities is quite straightforward now. Um, we're going to go back to our trusted cosine similarity. If you want to see how pr similar users are, you would calculate the cosine similarity based on the latent user features, and you would do exactly the same thing for the product features. Now, as a last thing, of course, how do I get from I have user A, and which products should I recommend him? So you, the mix between the two. Uh, I don't want to know how similar user A is to user B, but I want to know which products I should recommend for user A. Uh, also very simple, for example, for user B, uh, we're going to take the um, user features here. We're going to swap them, or like turn them around by 90 degree, degrees, and then you're going to do the cosine similarity again with product A, B, and C, and this would give you the best match of the products based on the cosine similarity. So like this, you can, because the numbers are symmetrical, you can just use them against each other, and like this, you would get the cosine similarity, and then you can see, okay, these products are probably most suited for that user. Quite straightforward if you know how to do this. Um, yeah, let's have a look at Scala. Um, most of the stuff, prediction I.O., what we're going to be talking about later, is written in Scala. Scala is a programming language. It runs on the JVM, so y anywhere you can run Java, you can also run Scala apps. Scala is uh, t statically typed, so it's like Java, um, strong typings. Um, it's even a bit more statically typed because there, um, no, sorry. 
Um, it's also fully object oriented. Um, unlike Java, also um, there is no uh, primitives. So also numbers are objects, which is nice to work with. But then it mostly is also it's a functional language. So that makes it a multi-paradigm language. It's object oriented and functional at the same time. But realistically, most people use Java in a Scala in a functional way. Um, it's been around for quite a while now, since 2004, but I think in the last six or seven years it really gained momentum with, with data analysis and data processing because it has very powerful features. And especially it's very well suited for dealing with a lot of data and for spreading that data across CPU cores and spreading it across, I don't know, 100 machines that live on the internet if you want to have like really massive parallel uh, processing. Some, no, some slides about functional programming. I had about 10 slides here, but I had to all kick them out because it just would take too long to go into the depth of functional programming. Just so very, very bird's eye view on what functional programming is. So basically the idea is that you have state-free immutable objects and you use pure functions to convert these objects. Okay, got to take that in. It's, it's uh, strange concepts you have here. So what does that mean? So start, let's start with immutable. Immutable means that you cannot change the state of your object. This is very, very different to object-oriented programming. With object-oriented programming, for example, you have your car object and you have methods on your car object and you can say, start me the car and this is going to change the internal state of your car object to the car is now running. With functional programming, how you would go about this is you would have a car object and you would have a function which takes a car object and gives me back a new car object where the car is running for now. Doesn't sound like much, but it's the, the concept is really quintessential here, that you do not manipulate your objects, you transform your object into new objects. So that means your objects have no state. There's no hidden data in, inside your objects. Why is this important? For example, if you want to have taken an object and copy it to another machine and work with it there, you would need to copy the internal state to have the same object. With functional programming, you don't need to do this. You can just take the object, copy it wherever you want, and it will work there. Pure function, this is also like a key concept in functional programming. Very short slide on that. I mean, you can probably spend years of your life in <laughs> improving your skills on functional programming just very quickly. So here what you have is you have your car object, you have a pure function that transforms your car object into a running car object. What does pure mean? Pure means a couple of things. For one, it means um, if you take a car and pass it to the function, it will always return the same output. So not at some point this car or that car, it will always do the same thing. It's very predictable what your function will do. It also means it has no side effects. So by starting the one car, I really want to avoid that by accident I shut down the other car, for example. So uh, no side effects at all. And what it should also not have is a dependency on external state. So no, I don't know, global variable that tells me how long my object should wait before the car actually gets started. Everything is encapsulated inside that function, so there's no external dependency. Functionally programming really thinks that a um, lot of program errors come from, um, internal, from side effects you have. So issues arise when you have side effects. If your functions are pure, then it's very unlikely that you're going to have error problems with it. And also, this is why functional programming is used in a lot of cases, because it avoids tons of problems you might normally have with uh, parallelization if you have to sync state between CPU cores at different machines. If you want to dive more into this, I can only recommend you this book. It's really good. Um, it's yeah, Professor Frisbee, guide to ad a mostly adequate guide to functional programming. Um, what I really like about this one here, it's free, as you can have it on the internet. It's even a bit funny, because a lot of lecture you're going to get on this is very, very dry and very mathematic. This, this is cool, he does it with JavaScript, and it's, it's a good starter if you want to learn more about functional programming. can only recommend it. So, what's next? Spark. As we said, Scala is really cool for manipulating dark data, but um, Spark is also written in Scala, but it's a sort of a toolbox that you add on top of Scala. So first of all, a lot of people think Spark is a database, which is not true. Spark is a general purpose clustering computing system, they say. So you can use it to distribute your code and your data across, I don't know, ten hundreds, thousands of machines very easily. It mostly runs in memory, so as opposed to Hadoop, where it comes from. Hadoop is a lot disk-based, and you load to memory, you process it, you save back to disk. Spark is disk-based. So if you run out of memory with Spark, then the easiest solution normally is to add another node and get more memory out of that. 
Um, as I said, it's written in Scala. Um, there's wrappers for it in Java, Python, and R. And what you normally do with it is basically you load data from other data sources. You go to your MySQL database, you go to CSV files, you go to Avro files, you can, I don't know, this virtually node format that's not supported, but you can, that you can use to pipe data into it. What does it give me? It gives me a number of high-level components. Uh, one of them would be SQL-like queries. I can pump a terabyte of data into it, and I can run SQL queries against it, where normally all my MySQL database or any SQL database would just barf under the load. It can do this very easily. It has some very powerful tools for machine learning, um, which we're going to be using in a bit. And it has graph processing and data streaming, which are more advanced use cases. The key component in Spark is what's called RDD. Um, the RDD stands for, um, oh, sorry, here we go. Um, the RDD stands for um, a Resilient Distributed Data Set. Um, it does a couple of things which are very cool to use. So one of them is that you can use it to parallelize your data. Hey, here's a 15 terabyte CSV file. Load it and Spark's going to convert it into RDDs, into small objects, and it's going to distribute this data across 10 machines if you wanted to do that. Um, what it can also do, it's some sort of a RAID system for your data. So in case one of your 10 machines fails, and because, I don't know, kernel panic, whatever, it explodes, then uh, uh, Spark and these RDDs, it's possible to take the data that was sent to the machine and ship it to another machine for reprocessing. So you don't have complete failure in case any machine fails. RDD levels that and it gives you more robustness to any machine failure. The RDDs themselves, because it's functional programming, are immutable. You cannot change them. Um, a problem with RDDs in the past was quite often that quite they're, they're mo often they're untyped. So you read a CSV file and you get all the uh, like a column with all the numbers in it, and then you have an error in your CSV file, and all of a sudden it's a string. The RDD allows you to do that. Quite often they're untyped, and this can of course cause a lot of problems down the road because, well, you can, as you can imagine, it's um, unpredicted and it's not really foreseeable how your machine's going to happen, how, how your system's going to handle this. Um, this is why they came up with uh, data sets in Spark 2. It um, uses a schema so I can really define what my data looks like and it's going to scream at me if I try to put in a wrong a string into a number field. Um, you can think of it of in memory tables which are massive distributed. You can use them like SQL, select star from data set where foo equals blah, no problem, you can do that. They are faster also, and they're inspired by Pandas data frame. You might have heard of that one. It's, it's a very powerful Python language for working with data. So this is what Spark gives you now. Um, the problem is, now you start developing, and you have your Spark app. You're going to write these recommenders, and you're going to program them, and it's very powerful. You can do this very quickly. The problem now is that you have this situation where you feel, hmm, I think I'm reinventing the wheel now because how do I deploy that stuff? How do I get it out as a web service I can speak to? How do I actually feed data into it in a, in a nice way? So it's like there's missing something. So you have the toolbox, everything's there you need, but a lot of times it would be really nice to have some another higher level abstraction which helps you working with that thing. And this is where Prediction I.O. comes into play. Prediction I.O. is a framework written in Surprise, Scala, um, and it's a framework for machine learning. Um, it offers you standardized components, how you can load your data, how you can train your models, how you can serve your, the results, and also how you can improve your models by evaluating them with different parameters. Um, Prediction AI also comes with an event server, which is a centralized database which you can use to push data into it. And it also allows you to run mul multiple engines, so you could have that similar products and that people who saw that also saw that kind of thing on the same server and it allows concurrently to use them. Um, at the heart of it, if you think about it, it really is a system that ties together the database, the event server, the APIs for it, and, uh, the, yeah, and the, the API and Spark together. So it's like bringing these three components together. Under the hood, it looks like this. Your website, your mobile app, your email campaign, your phone system or whatever you want to do is pushing data into the event server. The engines that you have, like the recommenders, for example, they pull the data from the event server, they crunch it, they process it, and then they generate models out of it. And then later on, you serve these models through APIs, and your sites, again, can pull these recommendations from the engine and serve them. Um, the good thing about the event server is that 
um, it abstracts away the database. Can have a look at this in a second. So how do I get data into the event server? It's most straightforward REST API. You can pretty much send requests directly from your website to this API and push data. There's also a Python SDK which allows importing data. Like mostly use this for bulk imports. And you can also directly import. What do I mean by that? It's under the hood. The event server has a number of storage backends that you can use. The most powerful one probably would be HBase, where you can, I don't know, store tons of data without any problems. Um, you can also use Elasticsearch, which then allows some more querying later on. And MySQL and Postgres is also possible for smaller projects, and it's quite sufficient unless you really start going up into the big numbers. The databases are transparent, as I said, so you don't care in your code which database is used to store the data. You have some abstractions on top of them, which you can use to, to query the data. The events you send to the event server look like something look something like this. So in our case now we want to work with products, we want to use with users. Um, so you see you have this dollar set event, which is a reserved keyword in the event server. We're gonna define the entities I'm working with. So we have user entities and product entities in our case. On the product entity, it's our trusty sweater A. I'm adding some properties, the prices you remember from before. Um, same thing for the user. We don't want to calculate similar users, so we're not pushing any uh, any properties here. But of course, you could do the same thing. It's, it's you can push whatever you want there. Um, the fun part is this one here. Um, now you have these entities, your users, and your products, and now you want to tell the system what actually happened on your site. And these kind of events are basically joining data together. It's not really joins. It's in, in, in the back end, it's just one table here. But here you're telling the system, user A saw product A. So it's a view event, and you have this entity type and the target entity type, and here you're doing the linking between these two uh, entities. And this, you can, yeah, as I said, you can do it through the API. At Rebel, we had the following setup that we'd say we the, the new products, and the users get collected through cron jobs, and they take the data from the database, and you say, hey, there's a new user, please store him. Oh, hey, there's a new product, please put it into the event server. And the tracking data, so the, the moving data, basically, of what happens on your site was done through an API. Um, we didn't want to expose prediction IO directly to the internet, so we wrote a really small wrapper with Nginx and Lua. It was only like, I don't know, 150 lines of code or so which implements a tracking cookie uh, or like a tracking pixel and gets called from the shop and converts the data a little bit and sends it into the event server. And this happens in real time, so you're constantly pushing the thing, the new data into the system. The engines, the heart of the whole thing. Um, on the right-hand side, you're gonna see the engine. You're gonna start with the data source. Obviously, you need to pull the data from somewhere and work with it. Um, this gives you something called a training data, data RDD. It's, we're working with RDDs again because we're in Spark context. Um, later on, you can pipe this data through something called a data processor. This is useful if you want to enrich your data. So for example, from the event server, you're only getting IDs and you want to work with strings now and you need to talk to your database to look up some keys and replace them with strings or something like that. This is what you can do in the um, processing, in the preparation, sorry. And then later on, you have a number of algorithms. A engine can have one to n algorithms, which in turn pull the data, the prepared data, um, crunch it, work with it, and they generate a model out of it. And this model gets persisted on disk, on HDFS, any storage system you like. And this is what's used later on to serve the requests. We'll be there in a second. Just one thing I wanted to show you here quickly. The engines themselves, they can have an engine.json file. It's just a configuration where you wire together the things. Uh, in this application, we have um, two stances we use. One is the data source, where I tell the engine which data source to use. We have a data source which is called shared engine. I don't want different data sources for different engines. We just push everything into one source, and then the engines themselves extract this from the, this source. And later on, uh, further below, you find the params. And here's some keys which I can tweak. So for example, the number of dimensions I want to use, or do I want the price to be more important than the other dimensions? So here I can set parameters to my engine. And we get to that why we want to do that in a bit. So quick rundown. These are the interfaces that uh, Prediction.io implements. And these you have to implement if you want to build your own recommender engine. Um, you have a data source object, which has a retraining method, which should return our RDD, the training data. You have the preparator, which 
basically does the same thing with enriching the data. And then the algorithm needs to implement two interfaces. One is the train, which takes the prepared data, works on it, and the other one is predict, which uh, you can guess, it takes the trained model and speaks to the model and serves the results. The last part is the serving part, where the serving part actually calls the algorithm, the predict method, uh, it might get back data from a number of, alg a number of uh, uh, algorithms, because we have, say, three algorithms. The serving part needs to decide then which data it wants to use. So, for example, it might merge the data or take one from here, take one from there. So it has the possibility of combining the data from the different engines you're training here. Um, other than that, I'm not going to show much code of this here. Um, there's a really cool website where they, you can have a look at all the templates that are used uh, in Prediction.io. And yeah, it's, it's a very, very, very good starting point. The serving part. That's the last thing. Uh, the server that receives the requests, the queries from the internet, is written in Akka. So it's very powerful. It can take uh, a lot of requests at the same time. It works especially well like this because the model stays in memory. So when you bring up a new engine, a new server, it loads the, the model, has it in memory, and then it just asks it when a request comes in and does the predictions. You can configure the query server, uh, the, the, the server to accept a number of query parameters. You could say, for example, blacklist this user, or don't show this product, this has been sold already, or I don't know, sort everything completely different. So you can pass in any query parameters you want, and then the serving part should react based on these parameters, of course. It also allows, and this is a cool feature, rolling updates. So uh, let's say every two hours we retrain our model because we got new data. And in this case, you could redeploy and um, the ACA server would phase out the old model, bring up a new one with a rolling update, and then you would continue serving requests from the new engine. So that works. The last part of the stack you have here is the evaluation. You remember we had these parameters before on the engine. Evaluation would mean the following. You could say, in my code, I have some performance metrics I give back, so accuracy, number of hits, like something that, that's suitable for, train, for, for saying how good my engine works. And the evaluation basically means that the engine's going to play around with the parameters. Oh, let's reduce the dimensions to 300, but increase the weighting. So it's going to play around. You can tell it, play around for, with it for, I don't know, a couple of hours, and then it's going to try to find the best combination of the parameters you can send into your engine. So this is very powerful if you want to fine-tune your engine and get the best results out of them. Um, yeah, one last thing I scraped before a bit earlier. What's very, very helpful, I can only recommend having a look at this, is since all the components in Prediction.io are standardized, you can have templates. So it's something like, I don't know, from other, from web frameworks, you would have MVC, and then you have this framework A, and there's all these plugins and cool features for it because it's standardized. So if you want to write a plugin, you're going to go with the infrastructure they have and with the architecture they use, and you can plug stuff in. And this is exactly the same for the uh, Prediction.io framework. They have this acronym called DAYS, well, whatever, data acquisition, sourcing, and, and evaluation. They dropped the training for some reason. And like this, you go into the website, and they're going to have, I don't know, 50, 60 templates for all sorts of recommenders, classification, regression problems. And this is a, really a very strong source for learning, because when you're new to this whole thing, you're a bit over overwhelmed. There's so much stuff you can learn, so much things you need to have a look at. And with this, you can just take a look at how some of these uh, problems were solved, really learn a lot by doing this. And yeah, so we used a lot of these uh, templates to get started, and then you tweak them for your own needs. This is a really very powerful tool. Um, yeah. The outlook, Prediction.io, it didn't look so good, I must admit, about two years back. Um, Prediction.io was bought by Salesforce, and after they did that, development completely stopped. And like, I know, all the developers ran off. It was an open source project back then, but uh, it's, so everybody ran off, which was a shame. So there was no development for almost two years. Um, then there's a company called ActionML. Um, they have a very, very sophisticated um, prediction engine. It's way beyond what we covered today. It's, it's, very, it's very powerful. And they use Prediction.io as their framework for running their engine, their ActionML engine. And so they took over maintenance. Now development has started again. Um, they had a new release a couple of months back where they now support newer versions of Elasticsearch. They bumped up the Scala version to 2.11, which is recent. And also they applied now for uh, leaving the incubating status at Apache which also means that they're going to receive money from the Apache Foundation if they leave that. And so I 
can say it's probably safe to assume that it will continue, so that it's not going to stop, and which is a good thing because I think it's a very good toolbox and it helps you with a lot of problems you're going to come across without having them to solve yourself, but you can actually focus on creating cool algorithms, not about how do I deploy this and how do I get this out into the internet. Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>